All right. Good morning, everyone. How you doing? Good. Excellent. Well, welcome to the Corning Museum of Glass and our hot glass show. Today, you are joining us for a very special live streamed demonstration. This is part of our You Design It program where we accept drawings and then we choose one and we make it out of glass. So this morning, the team, we've got Catherine Ayers. She'll be the gaffer for this piece of glass, the lead glass maker. She'll be joined by Helen Tegler assisting her. What do you say we start off by giving the team a big round of applause? Thank you. My name is Michael. I'm here for you. I'll explain the process. I'll answer questions if you have them. If you do, raise a hand, give me a shout. Be happy to answer them. We've got Amanda down here. She's running our live stream moderating on the internet. We have viewers from all over that will be joining us, tuning in as well. They can ask questions also. She'll answer them or she'll relay them to me to answer. And we've got Matt or Jason, someone in our AV booth running the uh, live stream for us as well. So anyways, this morning, Catherine is getting started on making an opossum on a pie. That's the drawing. You may have seen it. Uh, it was on our screens when we first got started, right before we started. That's an opossum on a pie. So that's the drawing. It was submitted by Lindsay from Ozark, Missouri. And Lindsay wrote to us about her idea and she said, I'm a ninth grade art teacher in Ozark, Missouri. We love watching the CMOG YouTube You Design It in class while we work. Right now, we are all really looking forward to our holiday breaks and mostly the pie. My idea is an opossum on a pie. He is, all capitals, not going to share. How rude. But that's okay, because uh, we've discussed the plan, and I think we're going to make a smaller pie, more of a personal size pie, so we're not vilifying this opossum quite so much. There it is, the, the drawing that she submitted, excellent drawing. You can tell she's an art teacher based on that drawing. Uh, so shout out to uh, Mrs. Johnson's class in Ozark, Missouri, the Ozark ti Tigers. Shout out to them. Now it's Sunday, of course, so they'll tune in at a later date. All of our live stream demonstrations, they do end up on our YouTube channel later. So if you're here in the audience, if you don't catch the whole thing, you can tune in, you can watch our extensive YouTube channel, you can see the finished piece uh, with an image of the, f the finished piece at the very end uh, as well. So Catherine's getting started now. This morning she did a little bit of prep work. She's already worked on the opossum hands. So those are made and we store those in a kiln on the side of the stage called a garage kiln. We call it that because we can make components and park them there and then use them later. We can pick them up later. So she's collecting some clear glass. She's rolling through some color. Now she has an entire assortment of glass colors here on the steel table in the center of our stage. We call this the Marver. It's a big steel table. It's also a tool. We use that to shape glass, to cool glass, and of course to hold all of our color. So she's working on, you're making the pie tin first, right? Yes, yeah, so she's gonna make the pie first and then we'll put that in the garage and we'll store that and then make the possum and this will all be assembled later on. So the glass that we're using, let's start there, it's soda lime glass. It's the most common kind of glass in the world. In the center of our stage, that's the heartbeat of the operation. It's our glass melting furnace. It holds about 1,000 pounds of clear molten glass when it's full. So it has 1,000 pounds of glass in there. We always start with clear because it's easier to begin with clear and then add color so that we can choose whatever color we want to make. We could, we could melt glass color, but if we melted color, then we would have to make 1,000 pounds of whatever color that is that we melt. So we start with the clear glass and we roll through these small crushed chips of colored glass called frit. So we have all these containers here, all these spice jars. We have a whole rack on the side of the stage there, but we have these just little chips of colored glass. We roll through these chips and they stick to the hot, clear glass and we can melt those in. That's kind of a fast, easy way for us to apply our color. And we don't make that color. It's commercially available. You can find it online. I think the website is hot glass color or just glasscolor.com, something like that. Very easy uh, to find. We have a, almost 200 choices of color, I would say, that we can pick from. Yeah. 
yeah, is the color all on the surface or does it go all the way through? Well, right now, it's just on the surface. Now we can make layers. So when we collect glass, we're always building that material up in layers. When we get glass out of the furnace, it's about the same viscosity as table honey. It's very runny. It can only support so much of its own weight. So we build it up in layers. We let one layer cool down, and then we can get more glass on top. Let that cool down, get more glass on top. So when we roll through these chips, we're actually just getting a really thin surface layer of color. So if we break one of our pieces of glass here and look at a cross section of the glass, we'll have mostly clear glass with one really thin layer of, of color on the surface. Or we can case that color in clear as well. So sometimes you'll have layers of clear, one layer of color, and then more layers of clear on top. But these different colors, they're made with different metal oxides and chlorides, elements from the periodic table, make our different colors. So everyone loves the dark cobalt blue down there. So to make cobalt blue, we add cobalt. To make gold ruby, we add gold. So depending on which metals are added, that changes the value of the color pretty considerably. But we have all these different colors down here. We have pie colors, we have possum colors, uh, all laid out and set. So we're working first on the pie tin. So that's what Catherine's got going on here. Now you can see she's added some texture to the pie tin by dropping that glass into an optic mold. We have a series of molds here on our stage that we can use different sizes, different internal textures. So she used a mold that has some straight ribs to give kind of that uh, well corrugated sort of texture that you see on pie pans. So that's what we're working on first. So we'll make the entire pie. And I'm not sure, I think from the drawing, it looked like it's maybe a, what would you say, is this a cherry pie? I think this is a cherry pie. So we'll make a cherry pie first, excuse me. So Helen, are you working on the, what is this? Is this the pie filling? The pie filling. So Helen just dropped some glass onto our steel table, this marver, and Catherine will just pick up that fresh bit of glass right on top. So hot glass sticks to other hot things. So when that fresh bit of glass is still really super hot on our steel table, we can just compress it onto the surface of that pie tin. So I believe now the plan will be to add the crust and add the nice lattice crust uh, on the surface of this pie. So what we're doing, we call a lot of this bit work. As we bring additional bits of glass, it's just bit work. So we can sculpt and add. It's a very much an additive process. Uh, and actually very little glass blowing when we do say that we're glass blowers. It's a really small portion of what we're doing, especially on a project such as this one. This is much more glass sculpture. So we can say that we're glass blowers, but it's a not a fully encompassing term of what all we're capable of. So Catherine and Helen, they're both really great glass sculptors. Everyone kind of has their own preference of what they like to do, what they like to focus on, what they like to make. I'm pretty good at making cups. I like to make cups. They're really good at sculpting. So she's pushing that color and that pie filling into the pie tin. And you can see the way that she rolled the glass on the steel table really helps shape up that pie tin. She kind of had a nice round shape originally. Rolling on that table, set the angle a little better for what a normal pie tin looks like. So she'll work on finishing that up. Helen is working on now the crust for the pie. So she'll get that going. She's using a nice light tan color called ochre yellow. So everybody here in our studio audience, you can really see this nice tan color that we have to make the pie crust. Helen has a lot of glass here, so she's gonna use this large amount of glass for uh, a feeder bit. So she'll be able to use this bit of glass to make multiple additions to the pie. So she can stretch it, put it on, cut some glass free, reshape it, heat it back up, and then reapply some more of that glass. 
So that's a quick way to be making these additional bits, these additional components that will add to the pie, as opposed to collecting glass and then adding color, melting the color in, collecting glass, adding color, melting the color in. We can really expedite the process. Some hopping in here. We're just straightening out this pie and adding a little bit of volume as well. So Catherine was blowing glass. You couldn't tell. We're blowing glass in a different way these days. For 2,000 years, the tradition has been that we collect glass on these hollow stainless steel blow pipes, and we put our mouth on the end of the pipe. We blow right through it and inflate glass. Of course, with masks, we can't do that. So we have this auto-inflation system. It's just some compressed air uh, at Catherine's feet. There's a pedal. We step on that pedal, it opens up the air valve, and it inflates glass for us at about 2 PSI. So very little pressure is required to inflate glass while it is hot. So there's a tube connected to the end of the pipe, and when we press that pedal, the air flows through that tube and inflates glass for us. So it looks almost like it happens by magic these days, but we are inflating glass through that compressed air system. So check this out, adding some of that crust, stretching the glass, winding it around the top, making a nice little circle. Now you can really see how far glass can stretch when we add these additional bits and when we add wraps like that. And Catherine was able to just cut that glass free. So she added it, that hot glass sticks to other hot things, winds it around and cuts it free to begin the crust. Any questions here at this point as we get started with our opossum on a pie? All right. So it does say in the, in the, artist's, in the artist's statement, it says specifically it's an opossum. So I did some quick Googling to find out the difference between an opossum and a possum. Some sources, Merriam-Webster, says you do not have to pronounce the O. Some places say you should pronounce the O because an opossum is the North and South American version of the marsupial, and a possum is the Australian version of the animal. In North America, we have the Virginia possum. That's the possum in all the Americas. But then in the Pacific, you have a, a different possum. It's slightly different. Uh, but from what I learned in my five-minute Google search was Captain James Cook, the British explorer, got to Australia and he said, well, it looks like a possum. We'll call it a possum. Hence the name possum. Uh, so apparently the distinction is, is regional between a possum and an opossum. Of course, someone should probably fact check that because that was my, my fast five-minute Google research. But you know, everything you see on the internet's true, so it's probably accurate. I think that's the, that's what they say. Sure. All right, so Helen has some more lattice work done for the pie. So I'm gonna hang on to the pipe so that Catherine can add this, do a little bit of sculpting from outside the bench. So she'll stretch and cut a little bit of this free. So stretching the glass, and laying it onto the top of the pie, just like how you would make a pie. So Helen's gonna heat that up a little bit further. They'll stretch it, add some more lattice, some more crust to the pie.
You're welcome. So in between the additions of that lattice work, I just took a short heat. Now, as we work through the entire process, we're using a reheating furnace here on the left side of the stage. So in the center of the stage, that's the glass melting furnace. On the left side of the stage, that's the reheating furnace. So there's no glass in that furnace at all. It's just a large chamber of heat. As long as we can keep the glass hot and soft and workable, we can keep working with it. As that glass cools, it becomes rigid and stable. It stops moving. But if it cools below a certain point, we're at a risk of that glass breaking. That's because as glass cools, it shrinks, it contracts, much like many other materials. As it heats and cools, it will expand and contract. But our glass, if it cools too quickly, it'll break. So we're always maintaining a temperature really above about 1,000 degrees while we work with this glass. Now, it never really looks like it's 1,000 degrees, or oftentimes through the process, it doesn't look like it's 1,000 degrees. It doesn't look like it's 1,000 degrees right now. Uh, but I can assure you, because it's not breaking, it is very hot. Now that brings me to another point. That pie filling, that bright red cherry pie filling that we've added, also doesn't look bright red. As the clear glass is hot, it has that bright orange glow. It's emitting that light energy through the glass. Well, our colors are also emitting that light energy, but it's through the different colors. So the red, it almost looks black. It looks dark brown, almost black. Greens, they look really orange. So as we work through this process, we're never going to see the true colors until we slowly cool this piece and see it fully cooled tomorrow. But because that glass has a tendency to break as it cools, we have a slow cooling process called annealing. So we'll put this glass into an oven on the side of the stage, that's what these big black boxes are, and we'll cool the glass overnight. Now that cooling time is dependent upon the thickness of the glass. So Something that's really thin, if we're making a nice little cup, if we're making a nice base, a lot of the things that we make here throughout our normal faster demonstrations, we can cool those in eight to 10 hours, no problem. But something that's gonna be thicker like this, that's gonna have more additional components, more little joints, we wanna cool that over a longer period of time. We want all of those variations in thickness to cool consistently so that the glass doesn't crack and break. So that'll be the end of the very Uh, the very end of this process is we'll load the opossum and the pie into the annealing oven to uh, well, bake, I suppose. We should say for this instance, the pie, we should say that it's to bake, but it's actually to cool down. So we have some nice lattice work on the pie. And I think we're getting uh, one more additional wrap that will go around the very edge for the crust. So some more of that stretching and winding of glass right around the very edge. So glass, we can actually stretch glass thinner than a human hair. We can stretch it so far and we can do it basically like this. Now that thicker glass stays hotter longer. So Catherine just pulled the glass into a fine thin thread and that thin thread was melted by the thicker mass on the edge of the crust and that's a quick way to apply material without having to cut it. Now she also started working on the pinches all the way around the crust. So she was using a pair of tweezers to kind of pinch the material just like you would see on the top of your crust. Now of course, uh, this will be a completed pie when we finish it, so we won't have to put that little crust protector on. When you bake a pie, you put that little ring on to protect the crust. Not needed here. But by pinching this crust, that's a great example of the malleability of our glass. Now you can also see that that glass kind of slumping, right? That's another indication of the heat. It's another indication of the temperature of that material. It's still moving at that connection point right near the end of the pipe. So that connection point that Catherine made, she made a little constriction. She really squeezed the glass down so that we can break this glass free from the pipe later on. So when we get further in the process, we'll have to break the glass off of the pipe. Obviously, we don't want a big metal pipe attached to it. So that narrow area that she made, that constriction, 
it serves kind of like the thin line in a chocolate bar. We can break chocolate easier where the chocolate is narrow. We can break the glass easier where it's narrow as well. So she'll use that little thin point as a means to remove the glass from the end of the pipe. So it's talking about the, basically, how much we can stretch glass over here. I actually have, this is an example of how far we can stretch glass. This is a little glass slinky that we made one day. So we, we can stretch and spool glass around a colder cylinder of glass. And then we can kind of break it off of that cold cylinder. And now we have this fun little slinky toy. Uh, it doesn't quite go down steps, but this is a great example of sort of the elasticity of glass. It kind of just goes right back to its original form when we make a little slinky. So, very fun. Now, the interesting thing about glass also is when you pull it out into these thin threads, it's perfect for transmitting information. You've probably all used glass today to transmit information if you've been on your cell phones, if you are watching our YouTube live stream. It's probably information being transmitted through optical fiber, glass fibers stretched actually much thinner than this, transmitting information as light. So that's a different type of glass than what we're using. We're using soda lime glass, which is the most common kind of glass in the world. It's about 90% of all glass. It's your bottles, your windows, your jars. And that glass is silica, which is sand, soda ash, and limestone. The soda ash, that's a flux. It helps the glass melt at a lower temperature. The limestone is a stabilizing agent. It makes our glass hold up over time. Without it, glass can actually be water soluble. It can break down over time just from humidity in the air. But the glass that you use for optical fiber, it's fused silica. It's a different type of glass. And that glass melts at nearly 4,000 degrees. Our glass is melting at 2,100 degrees. Now, we also use that fused silica glass here for all of our demonstrations. That view inside of the reheating furnace is possible because we have a little window that's fused silica glass. So it's not melting in our 2,000 degree furnace. And behind it, we have a camera. And then next to that camera, we also have a fan blowing on the camera, making sure that it doesn't get uh, too hot. So, when we use that view of inside the reheating furnace, that's all because of that fused silica glass that you also use every single day. So everyone knows what this is, right? It's the whipped cream on top, and then we'll get a cherry. Yes, yeah, so there's a little bit of whipped cream on this pie, and then we'll add the cherry. So another example of the malleability of glass, how much it wants to flow when we stop turning. Helen brought that glass over, that whipped cream, she delivered that really hot, she stopped turning, and that glass fell right towards the ground. Catherine caught it on top of the pie, and then she twisted it, made a perfect little whipped cream swirl on the top of the pie. So she'll work on finalizing that. Helen is going to get started on the cherry. And we're well on our way through the opossum on a pie, you design it illustration. Now, if you're already enjoying this as much as I am, you can make your own drawing. You can submit your own drawing anywhere you are in the world. You can look at our website and you can submit a drawing for a you design it illustration. And if you're lucky, maybe we'll choose your drawing and make that in one of our future demonstrations. Now, the great thing about this is that if we choose your drawing, you get the glass piece. We'll send it to you. So Lindsay in Ozark, Missouri, will get this piece once it's all finished. So there it is, the view inside the reheating furnace. You can really see the top of the pie, the beautiful lattice work, when we heat. So our glass color doesn't necessarily work like paint. You don't really mix those colors, but we can layer those colors. And when we layer the colors, they don't, they don't really, they don't mix. They don't 
sort of blend or bleed together. But what Helen has done is she's just used some red glass, some opaque red glass, and then on top of that, she rolled through some gold rubies. So it's a transparent pink glass. And when you roll transparent pink glass over red glass, it just makes it a little more vibrant, gives it a brighter color. So the transparent color, while it doesn't mix, it does appear different when you have that opaque glass underneath it, especially red glass. If we're using transparent colors, oftentimes we'll use white underneath. It's like gesso on a canvas. It really helps that color pop. But when we use different uh, opaque colors, that can really change the color of the transparent. So the pink on the red will make this really pop, be a brighter red, and it will also distinguish that color a little bit from the cherry pie filling. This torch that Catherine's using is an oxygen propane torch. Now you'll see her use this more probably as we get further into the process and especially as more of that sculpting of the possum really begins to take place. That torch allows us to heat one area of the glass really quickly and very accurately. So that torch is she's using it just to, uh, just to torch the very top of the whipped cream so that we have a really hot spot for a connection for the cherry on top. So that cherry is also pretty warm. So the hotter these connections, the more permanently they stick together. And there we go, a nice little cherry on top. But that hot torch, we can dial that up to nearly 4,000 degrees. So we can make that torch really, really hot. That's one of the things we've kind of taken from the flame working community. Glass baking over a torch, typically with borosilicate glass. It's another type of glass you probably are familiar with borosilicate by its brand name of Pyrex. It's a glass that has a lower coefficient of thermal expansion. You can put it in your oven and it won't blow up. This glass, if you put it in the oven, can break. But that torch is used for a lot of that flame working process. And that's something that we've adopted here into what we call furnace working, using our giant furnace to make and melt glass. So that torch is a really great tool. That's one of the newer developments. For us, glass making hasn't really changed, changed so much in the 2,000 years that humans have been blowing glass. But the torch and then really just changes in equipment have been the biggest uh, adjustments in the process. So I think we are all done with the pie. It looks wonderful. Yeah, I think they should get a big round of applause. It's a good looking pie. So that will go into the garage kiln. That will be maintained at a temperature right around 1000 degrees. It's hot enough that it won't crack and break, that it won't cool, won't crack and break. But it's also cool enough that that glass won't start to deform. It won't slump, it won't melt back onto itself. So we've got our little roller machine here. It's a automatic machine. There it's a set of wheels and a motor and it will turn this pie in the oven. So now it's a rotisserie pie. So Helen's getting that all sorted. And in the meantime, Catherine's getting started now on the opossum. So Catherine's going to start on the body, and before we started here today, uh, it's not super exciting to watch, she made the opossum hands, or feet probably, probably feet. So she made those, so they're in the garage, and also the head, the opossum head is in there as well. The head is just one of those things that takes kind of a long time, so by pre-making some of those parts, we can expedite the process and the assembly, especially when we have for our you design it and our daily scheduled programming, uh, a limited window uh, for working. So she'll get started on the body. She's on another blow pipe so that she can blow this up and inflate it. And when we sculpt, we typically leave that glass a little bit thicker when we sculpt it. And that's so that it doesn't 
heat up really quickly and it doesn't really deform. If you try and make a possum and you blow this really thin, elegant, delicate possum, when you start assembling those parts, you have it heating up, you can actually collapse your, your possum body. So this won't be inflated a ton. This will be thicker sculpted glass. Any questions I can answer? Anyone wondering anything? No? All right. Yes. Sure, yeah, do we have to wear tinted glasses? You know, we don't really wear tinted glasses so much. We're not too worried about, you know, soda flare or anything coming out of that reheating furnace. Uh, it does get a little bit obnoxious on cloudy days, kind of like today. It's a pretty dark space, so if it's cloudy and it's dark outside, if it's a gloomy day, it's a little tougher for the eyes to adjust between looking inside the reheating furnace and looking at the glass when you sit down. But we do have a little shield on our heat shield. So in front of the, the reheating furnace, we've got that stand there, that heat shield. We kind of stand behind that just so we're not getting blasted with 2,000 degree heat all day long while we work. And in there, is, we have a little shield. It's a didymium lens, so it's kind of a dark purple tinted lens. And we can look through that, and that sort of alleviates some of, some of the, the brightness coming from the furnace. Now, if we use those re those hot torches, sometimes we'll wear, yeah, sometimes we'll wear glasses as well. Yes? Yeah. Catherine, I'll get you a bigger tin in one second. You both needed me at the same time. The white smoke. Okay. But yeah, if we're flame working, if we're using those hot torches for an extreme or a long period of time, we will definitely wear glasses that help protect our eyes. We're more concerned here about glass breaking. So you'll see us wearing safety glasses, or some type of eye protection to make sure that we're protected a little bit from glass breaking and flying. Now, in a beginner class where you have less experienced glass makers, you're much more worried about glass breaking off of the pipe or hitting the floor. With experienced makers like Catherine and Helen, we're more concerned about glass breaking off of the pipes and flying. So when the glass cools and the pipe cools, they cool at different rates and the glass will pop off and it can sometimes really go flying quite a distance. It breaks, seems pretty good, breaks with quite a bit of force. So what we have is this tall bin, and we put all of our pipes in that tall bin, and that sort of pretend, uh, pre prevents and protects us from glass flying out a serious distance. This whole thing flips over as well.
All right, I'm back. We were just getting the uh, pie adjusted a little bit in the garage kiln. The balance wasn't quite right on our wheel setup to keep that pie turning, but that's okay. We just have a brick in there, so now we don't keep it turning. It'll just stay in one place. It'll be fine. So we're just getting that adjusted. So now we're moving into making the possum. Uh, Catherine is using a color called white smoke. And the word possum, this is another of one of my opossum facts for my quick Google search. Uh, the word that it derives from means white beast. Very intimidating name for an opossum. We were also looking at opossum pictures before we got started. We typically will look at images so that we have something to reference. Even though we have a drawing, it's still good to look at the actual animal. And we determined that when, opo when an, an opossum has its mouth closed, it looks pretty cute. When it has its mouth open, it looks terrifying. It's vicious, it has big teeth. It's very mean. But we should like opossums. They eat a lot of ticks, they eat a lot of bugs and grubs, things like that. So if you're a gardener, if there's an opossum nearby, not the worst thing. Check it out, really swinging and stretching, elongating the body of the opossum. Now, depending on how we heat the glass and depending on the angle of the pipe, that's always going to have an effect on the glass on the end of the pipe. So heating the bottom really two thirds of that bubble, holding the glass down towards the ground, stretches and elongates the glass. So we'll use gravity to our advantage quite a lot. We do this to change the shape of the bubble, change the shape of the glass without touching it. This is great because anytime we're touching the glass, we're cooling it down. So if we can change the shape without cooling it so much, it's just a more efficient method of working. So if we're making a bowl, if we want to make something that's low and wide, we can hold the glass up towards the sky. It'll actually squat back into a lower, wider shape. If we want to make something really tall, we'll use gravity, we'll hold the glass down towards the ground. You even saw Catherine swinging the glass. We can use that additional force to help stretch and elongate the material as well. So we're constantly thinking about what's the most efficient method. And when you first start learning how to blow glass, you're terribly inefficient at glass making. If you watch a beginner try to make a cup, it will probably take them an hour to make a cup. And even then, that cup will be very thick. I like to call it a Flintstone cup. It's really thick, it's heavy, it's solid. If you drop it, it'll probably just bounce a couple times. It'll be totally fine. Um, and a lot of that comes down to the turning. You'll notice that while we use gravity to our advantage, we also have to counteract gravity all the time. So Catherine's left hand, it's the motor, it's the driving force that keeps pipes turning and keeps the glass on center all the time. And there's not really anything we do on a day-to-day -day basis that translates into that uh, you know, finesse or the motor skills to be turning a pipe all the time. So if you can't be turning evenly and consistently with really hot glass, you have cold glass. And cold glass is much harder to work with. It takes way longer to accomplish anything with cold glass. But because Catherine's been blowing glass for around 20 years, she's very skilled at turning the pipe and making it do what she wants, turning that glass into a possum body. So she just did a very cool move. She just flattened this out quite a bit. She bent the glass to make this possum. So when this is all said and done, that illustration, uh, that possum is holding the pie. Now, we sometimes have to adjust the, bot, the, the illustrations a little bit, but essentially, the possum will be the foot. So the possum will be the base and will be supporting the entire pie. So we have to design this so that when we're all done, we have a spot where the possum can sit and hold the pie up and support the pie. So that's what we really started doing there was shaping the body so that it can wrap around to be eating a pie all on his own.
they just added a little bit of glass right onto the back of the opossum. Now this is going to be a place where we can put a secondary pipe and that will allow us to work on finishing the top of the possum where it's connected to the pipe. So where it's connected, we'll break that glass free, finish sculpting, attach the rest of the components and the bits. But while we do that, we need to work on a, another iron, another pipe. So I think the plan is, I'm trying to listen while I'm also talking to you, but I think the plan is that they'll create a blow punty. So a punty is a temporary handle that we attach to the objects so that we can keep working on them. But this will be made on a blow pipe so that we can add a little bit of volume and continue to inflate glass. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. All right, so I've been filled in. We're adding the pie next. So Helen's going to get the pie warmed back up. So she'll move it from the garage back to the reheating furnace. And Catherine's going to glove on the pie. So she's going to put on our big glass studio size oven mitts. They're much thicker than your standard oven mitt at home. They're made of a Nomex and Kevlar. It's kind of it's a blend of the two. It's the same material used for firefighting suits. So she'll be able to grab the pie with these gloves and she'll be able to hang on to probably about a minute before the gloves and her hands start to really get warm. So she'll grab onto the pie and place it onto the body of the opossum. So in the meantime, I'm in a holding pattern. I'm just maintaining the temperature of the body. So I'm taking short heats, short maintenance flashes so we call those short heats as a flash. Taking short maintenance flashes to ensure the temperature of this glass doesn't get so cold that it can break. Okay. So where they break the pie free from the pipe, that hole will actually be closed up because it's going to contact the body the belly of the opossum. So we're going to make a small hole in the side of the pie somewhere. And essentially what we're doing is we're making sure we're not creating a vacuum with this glass. We don't want the glass to be completely enclosed because as it cools, if it's completely enclosed and there's that vacuum that's created, it will potentially break just because of the volume of air inside, not having anywhere to escape. So there's just a really small hole, won't even really be noticeable, but that allows as the glass shrinks and contracts, the air inside to escape. So that's a lot of things to think about, making sure that the uh, air inside the pie has room to escape. We've broken the pie, and now we'll hot torch the bottom of the pie. So really heat the bottom of the pie a lot. So that it will stick to the belly. You can see a little bit of the uh, flame sneaking off the edge, getting the gloves there. So on goes the pie. Nice firm push. Yeah, big round of applause. Pie on an opossum. So while we work in traditional glass making practices, we make a lot of vases, and we think about those objects, those are all perfectly symmetrical. And while you turn, that weight is evenly distributed around the center axis. Now that we have this awkwardly shaped opossum and a pie on top of it, as you turn, you have these heavy sides and you have these light sides. And as you turn, 
you're kind of fighting the glass from falling one direction, and then you kind of have to fight to get it turned back up on top. So once you have something that's offset and off-centered like this, it becomes much more difficult to turn, and it becomes much more challenging and much, much more taxing on the arms, that's for sure. All right, so we've got a couple questions from the internet. One was, why did Catherine have to keep torching while she was drilling the hole in the pie? And we're not just using a standard drill bit to drill through our glass. We're actually using a pointed tungsten rod. So we preheat the tungsten rod. If we have kind of cold glass and we have a hot tungsten rod, we can puncture through the glass. We can push through the glass. But while we drill through, we kind of heat back a little bit further on that tungsten rod. We don't want it to get so hot that it sticks to the surface of the glass but we want it to be warm enough that it can puncture through. So we torch the backside of that tungsten rod to keep the heat in while we're drilling through that pie. So that's why we torch that, that tungsten. That's why we torch that drill bit that we're using while we continue to drill through the glass. Now the other question that we got from the internet was, how strong is the glass that we're using? Now that's a very open-ended question because we're using soda lime glass, and that's the most common kind of glass in the world. So that's bottles and windows and jars, and depending on how you treat that glass changes the strength and changes the durability of the glass. So you can have soda lime glass that's tempered, just like your car windows. So they're very, very strong, but as soon as they break, they explode. They fail catastrophically. It's so that tempering process Basically, the window will be cut to the shape and cut to the dimensions that you need, and then it's brought almost to a point where it's molten again. And then that glass is blasted with air in really specific uniform patterns. And the glass creates compression stress, and it squeezes glass on the interior. Yes? Yeah, I'd be happy to. So it creates compressive stress, and the glass inside is under tension. So the compressive stress is really, really strong, but then the tension, if the compression layer is broken, will fail catastrophically, and that's why when car windows break, they break into those little tiny pieces. Now, of course, that glass, you would say it's pretty strong glass. Our glass, because we're just cooling it, we're annealing it, if you drop it, it's still likely to break. So it depends really on how you treat the glass for what determines its strength. Yeah, yeah, I'm good. So I'm going to help Catherine out. I just talked about how awkward this is to turn. She's been doing most of the work. So I can hop in. She can sit at the bench. She can be controlling the heat, I can be taking short flashes while they get going on the next parts. And the next parts, those are the legs. So we've got one leg wrapped around the pie. Okay. So this allows me to hold the pipe down to make sure it doesn't really turn while Catherine is placing those legs where she wants them. Now she puts the legs on and she makes the leg kind of short and then she stretches it and cuts it free. This is really holding on. I, you know, if I had an entire pie to myself, I would hold on to it tight too. So we're taking just these short heats, maintaining the overall temperature. Now, you can really see that leg that we just put on still has much more glow than the rest of the piece. The hottest thing into the furnace, that's the hottest thing back out of the furnace. So if we needed to, we could make little adjustments at that point, but it's a one-shot wonder there.
So the first leg, that's always the easy leg to put on. But all of the following legs, those are much harder because you want them to kind of match. So Catherine is not only trying to do the exact same moves every time, let me flip that over, but she also really relies on Helen to bring the glass shaped the same way, in the same temperature, the same setup. So we've got one more leg. And Catherine said, we'll go right for the hands after this leg goes on. So those hands, or the opossum feet, whatever you like to call them, those were pre-made. They're sitting in that garage kiln on the other side of the stage, ready to be assembled. One of the other things I learned in my quick opossum Google search is that opossums, apparently, just their back feet have opposable thumbs. But I don't know if that's true. I only saw that on one source. So if we have any opossum experts in the audience or online, you can fact check that. They eat ticks. Yeah. Yeah, if you know, just get an opossum to take care of the ticks in your yard. So some visitors the other day said they have two opossum rescues. Do, do they keep them as pets? What's the pet opossums? So I'm just taking these short heats. Catherine is torching where that first foot will go. So building up temperature, building up heat in that connection point. So Catherine preheated the tweezers she's using. We want to make sure we don't thermally stress the glass. We don't cool it too rapidly by grabbing it with a cold steel tool. We don't want to crack the glass. So she preheats those tweezers preheats that location where that opossum hand will go, places it down. Now we've got one hand on the body, hanging onto that pie. Now, Catherine, did you uh, make these right or left-handed? Did you? Yeah, if there are thumbs, that makes a big difference. We also Googled what their feet look like. And they have some pretty, pretty wild looking feet. They do look a lot like human hands, but then they have these big long nails that look more like bird talons. If I encountered this opossum hanging onto a pie so tight, I would let it be. So you deserve that pie. Thank you. 
So, Lindsay, our designer, she's watching the, the live stream, and she's just tuned in and said that uh, she loves opossums, which is good because apparently her dog delivered a live opossum to her bed at 2 in the morning. I think that would uh, maybe ruin my love for possums a little bit. She also has one that shows up on her ring camera. It's probably the same one. There we go. Incredible. We've got four feet, which is a mighty feat all on its own. How about a big round of applause? Job well done. Delicate precision to apply those really coming to life. Now curling those fingers around the top of the pie. Sounds like the next part of the plan is to add the head, and then the tail will be the last component to go on. So just finishing up the hands here. So in that garage kiln, we have a hot side and a cold side. So the head was being stored on that far right side, away from the burner. And then we move it over and start to slowly warm it up on the left side, closer to the flame. What we're trying to avoid is thermally shocking that glass, just by heating it up too quickly when we go over to the reheating furnace. So now we've got another hole in the back of the body because we will close this body up again. So again, we don't want a closed form without a way for the air to escape as the glass cools. So Helen's got the head over there taking a short heat. Catherine's warming up the, the tongs. Grabs the head, torching the head as well. Do you want this pie up or down? 
All right. So here comes the head. Pushing that on. And now you will all get a great view inside the reheating furnace of this possum head. Excellent job. It's always a little bit scary when we have to make those attachments. Yep, yeah, good, thanks. But it looks great. I love the way that the head really wraps around the pie as well. It is kind of scary. That's what I was talking about. As soon as you can see those teeth on a possum, it's much more intimidating. Yeah. Okay. So I'm just going to hang on to the opossum. Catherine's going to get started on the tail. So I'll just be in a holding pattern. I'll maintain the temperature here. And she'll get started on the tail. So we have a variety of sculpting tools here. And one of the tools that Catherine just used to push the glass down around the neck and around the back of the head, it's one of our favorites, a butter knife. Most of our tools that we use here, they are made specifically for glass making. And there are really only a handful of glass tool makers, probably four or five really well-known glass tool makers around the world. You can imagine it's a pretty niche market making glass blowing tools. But the butter knife, that's a good one. You can get that anywhere. So the tail, it's pretty big and it's long and it wraps around the pie. So as we assemble this, we have to think about the order that we will assemble it and the order that we'll put all these components together. And when you have a tail that's big like that and wraps around, you kind of want that to be the final component, the final part of the, the final piece of the puzzle, I should say. And that's because that tail, if it's free and it's not really connected everywhere, as you heat it, it will heat up and it will start moving around. So we're always thinking about the order that we assemble our components. 
It's just like if we're making a pitcher, we make a pitcher, the handle will be the last thing that we add onto the pitcher. So most of our glass making processes really come from a foundation. It comes from building blocks. So it's common that when you first start learning, you'll learn first just how to get glass out of the furnace. Then you'll start by blowing bubbles and then maybe making a cup and then making a mug. And if you can do those things, then you can really start changing those bits that would be a handle to be an opossum leg. So it's all about a foundation and then building upon that, those building blocks and saying, what do I know how to do? What are the techniques that I know? And how can I apply those to make something different? So most of us have learned at college or university, that's the common way to learn how to be a glass blower these days. But you don't have to go to school to be a glass maker. You can learn by taking public access classes. Just across the parking lot here at the museum, we have our public access studio, the studio at the Corning Museum of Glass. And we teach classes there. We have artists come and teach and take classes from all around the world year round. But depending on where you are, you can look up glass studios near you. You might be surprised at how many glass studios there actually are. But you could be an apprentice, you could learn in that one of those public access settings. There are still some few, but some factory jobs where you can learn and become a glass maker that way. But but it's common to learn in school. So we're doing a little work on the ears. Now, Catherine's adjusting the flame. Some of our colors, because they're made with different metal oxides and chlorides, when we expose the glass to a different type of flame, a really uh, gas-rich flame, the metal oxides from the glass, can I flash this? Okay. The metal oxides from the glass can actually be pulled to the surface we call that reducing. So it actually just made the backs of the ears kind of shiny and black. Catherine said that the ears, the backs of the ears are more black. But sometimes when you reheat the glass, some of that color can leave, but it looks like it's sticking around. That's good. You got a big tail here. So Catherine's going to make the tail. She'll actually sculpt this out. We'll remove it from the end of the pipe. Yeah, thanks. And then we'll store that in the garage as well. Then we'll attach it in a little bit. So she just dropped that glass into an optic mold, picked up some texture on the surface of the glass. Now when we use color, really what that's going to do is that's going to create different areas of density in the color. And as she heats that, I think she'll twist it a little bit. Looks like we've got a nice pattern on the tail of the illustration. So as she heats that and twists it, that will twist the different variations in density, the different variations in color on the tail and it will make a more dynamic tail. So we can twist that a couple ways. She used first a pair of shears. She grabbed and twisted the glass. But we can also turn on this steel table, this marvering table, and we kind of hold the glass in place. Just the friction from the table will help twist that color up as well.
Oops, there we go. Really stretching that tail. And check this out. Nice curve of the tail as well. So she grabs that with a pair of shears and she's sort of pulling and twisting, increasing that texture. Now, I've never pulled taffy, but I've heard a lot of people say that it's a lot like pulling taffy. Now, that excess glass that she doesn't need, she'll just cut that free. So all of our scraps, pieces like this, we have to recycle. And we recycle all of the glass that we use here, not necessarily back into our furnace or to make something beautiful another day. Those scraps from that tail, that excess tail, we'll send that off to a company here in Corning. We work with a contractor that will take all of our glass scraps, our contaminated glass or a glass with color, They'll grind it up and they'll mix it into concrete and asphalt. So they'll use it as a bit of a binding agent. They'll use it as an aggregate. So it does get recycled for an industrial purpose. Our clear, clean glass, we'll recycle that. We can put it right back into our furnace. We can use that to make something beautiful another day. What's that? Okay. Yeah, I'm okay, thanks. Are you okay? Yeah, okay, great. Helen, are you okay? You're welcome. Amanda, doing good? Excellent, just do a welfare check on the team. We're all doing well. Everyone in the audience? Doing well? Fantastic. And we'll assume all of our viewers online are also doing great. We'll assume they're watching from the comfort of their home in pajamas. And they're enjoying this as well. All right, got a tail. That looks great. I love that final curl on the tail. Do you want the bench? Do you want the rail? Look at this, what a fantastic photo opportunity, Amanda. We got a opossum without a tail, but its tail's right by it. How fun. So they're just using that torch to heat that area, that connection right next to the pipe to make that constriction where that tail will be broken free from the pipe later on. So that tail, that'll go into, into the garage kiln. All right, so torching that back, because again, that's where this opossum will sit. And remember, we made a hole there, and we also put a clear patch there earlier on in the process as well. That's where we will attach the blow punty, so a secondary handle and actually a secondary blow pipe that will go right on the back. So we'll attach that to the back of the opossum and then we can break it free using this constriction where the tail will go, and then we can add the tail. So in the meantime, I'm just maintaining the temperature, torching those fragile bits, those thin ears, that connection where we'll break the piece free from the pipe. And while I do that, Catherine is working on the blow punty, so it's a blow pipe that she's blown glass through, so we call it a collar, so that we can attach it, we can add further inflation if we need to. We need to change the possum if we need to inflate it at all, but we shouldn't really. We will attach that to the back of the possum and then break it free from the pipe. So while she works on that, I'm just hanging out keeping everything nice and warm. 
So anytime we make these transfers, we break glass intentionally. We hope that it breaks just where we tell it to, but it is always a little bit of a nerve wracking moment. Say the three T's to glass making are timing, temperature, and teamwork. I can break it off. Huh? I can break it off. Yeah. Or is it easier if uh, you break it off so that you can put the punny down? So this is that punty connection, so she'll place this down. Gives it a good push, make sure that it's well attached. You want a little water? Maybe one drop. So a little bit of water on that constriction. Create some thermal stress. A light tap is all it takes. How about a big round of applause? Always a nerve wracking moment. So a little drop of water on that narrow area creates thermal stress, makes little cracks. That tiny tap, that vibration, all it takes to break the glass free. Oh my gosh, this looks fantastic. Would any of you mess with that opossum to try and get a bite of pie? I wouldn't. All right, so they'll work on just getting everything situated, getting everything sorted before putting that tail on. Any questions I can answer here in the audience? No? All right, well, don't forget, if you would like to see one of your designs be made right here by our team in our amphitheater hot shop, you can submit designs. You can go online to our website, cmog.org, and you can find information to submit drawings, make a drawing. That shot right there, the opossum just hanging. Also, spinning looks like he's really on a ride, just being spun around on the end of the pipe. All right, so I'll start warming up the tail. They've just closed off that opening where the opossum was attached to the pipe. So I'll warm up the tail. Now Catherine's gonna catch the tail in the gloves and she'll gl uh, attach the tail using the gloves. Now one of the questions we had from our viewers online was, how do glass blowers learn so much about the material science of the glass that we're working with? And I think that most of the glass blowers that know a lot about material science of glass don't intend to learn about the material science. It just happens. It's a natural curiosity. It just comes from working with the material and picking that information up online. I know that when I first started learning, let me give one quick flash. I know that when I first started learning, that wasn't the main focus. The main focus was mostly just how to handle the glass safely and carefully. So it just comes from sort of working with the material, the natural curiosity, 
breaking things, trying to figure out why they broke and how to not break them in the future. And then of course here, working at the museum, working with a lot of other glass blowers that have a lot of knowledge and working in a place where there's so much innovation in glass and science of glass with Corning Incorporated being here. Kind of just inevitable, it's bound to happen. But here we go, at attaching the tail. Oh yeah, what do you think? That's great. I'm gonna give you another door here. So our reheating furnace, we have three sets of doors so that we can make larger work. And we've got all three doors open on one side here so that that tail fits into the furnace. So using this torch, we can just torch that center bit of the tail. I think Catherine's plan is to wrap that, coil it up a little bit more just around the pie, a little bit further. So she uses the gloves, uses a wooden paddle. We want to use materials that are really soft on that glass. So she just wraps that around. So the great thing about these U Design It's is that the designer gets the piece when it's all said and done. Now that's, uh, of course, assuming that our team is able to get this piece away from Catherine. I just heard her say she loves it. Might be hard pressed to give this one away. We make glass all day long and we're very lucky that we get to make glass all the time and do the thing that we all love most and are most passionate about. And it gets a lot easier to give glass away when you first start learning. You wanna keep everything, you wanna hoard it. And if you really like something, usually you give it to one of your family members because they're obligated to keep it. And you, then you know that it's safe. But of course, as you get better at glass blowing, you'll go back and you'll look at some of those first pieces and you're just like, oh, can we get rid of this please? This is terrible. And uh, usually whoever you gave that piece to, they wanna keep it. But every once in a while you make something like an opossum holding a pie and then uh, it's tough to give up. So we're pretty much done now with the opossum on a pie, but there is one final step remaining and that's one of the big steps. That's that slow cooling process, annealing. I talked about it a bit earlier. We have to slowly cool everything that we make. We have to relieve all the internal stress and strain in all of the glass that we have here. So all the different thicknesses, all the variations in thickness, those little bits, those components, those attachment points, they all need to slowly cool to relieve that stress that builds up in the glass as it does cool down. So we'll cool this for at least 12 hours, we might even do 16, just to make sure that we can cool it sufficiently and safely. But that annealing process, that's a life lesson you learn in glass blowing. Don't fall in love with something too, too fast because sometimes you can open up that annealer the next day and something has gone terribly wrong. Of course, we'll knock on wood since I just said that. But a few short heats will maintain the temperature and even out the temperature in this entire opossum and then we'll load this into that annealing oven. So Helen's got the protective equipment on. She's got some of those big gloves on as well. She's got a sweatshirt. She's got a face shield so that she can hang on. 
to this piece and load it into that 900 degree oven without getting a terrible haircut. So some water on that connection. Light tap breaks it free. We'll do a little fire polishing. Remove any of those sharp edges. Then we'll load this away into our annealing oven so that we can see this piece again tomorrow. Navigating the shop carefully around the air conditioning vents. And tucked safely all the way in the back. And it sits perfectly. Job well done. Let's hear it one more time. Catherine Ayers, Helen Tegler, our designer, Lindsay, a fantastic job, fantastic demonstration.